So I picked up another integration test story and why I keep picking these up, I don't know, but we're picking up another one. And these have to do with a migration we did a few months ago. We migrated from say service A to service Y and changed the backend dependency that we use for our service. Technically we are backend, but this is like farther into the backend. And when we did this migration, we wrote the unit tests, but we decided to not write the integration tests and save that till later, and now it is later. We talked a little bit about this last time, but an integration test is where you test something from end, from the end to end. And in this case, it's the end to end within my code. And usually it involves a little bit of mocking, and so, our process, our code, uses certain dependencies. And so we use dependency A, B, and C, we get data from them, we process it, and then we return it. And this migration essentially had us change one of our backend dependencies, we were using A, now we're gonna use Y. And now we need to write the integration test to make sure our process still works end to end. And the reason we skipped the integration test to start with is because we really wanted to get this out to production. There were a lot of benefits It made our service faster. We were using less calls, less data. The new service, Service Y, gave us a different types of data that allowed us to make our process more sophisticated, more enhanced. It made the feature better. It was a big deal to do the migration and we wanted to get it out. And so we left the integration tests as tech debt, which now we have to do. Now we did write some integration tests when we did the migration, but in order to get this to work, we disabled some of them with this at disabled annotation, which allows you to disable tests and we made it really easy. So now we're at the part where we undisable the tests and we make them work with our code base. We made them really searchable. And so you could easily search for the at disabled tag and be able to find the ones associated with the migration. So with the disabled tag, that means I can just control F and see how much work this story will be. Um, but while doing control F, I realized we could also disable entire test classes. So I thought it was only gonna be like 30 tests, but it's actually much more than that. But then I was thinking about it and it's not actually about the number of tests. Theoretically, I just wanna change all of the mocks from A to Y and translate the data. It was in form A and I need to translate it to form Y so that all the tests pass. Because really, I wanna keep the integrity of the tests because they already check a lot of things that go on in the process. I just need to change how the data is formatted in the mock so that it's in the form of service Y. So the actual test won't change. I'm changing the input to the test or the backend data that we get that'll be used in the test and it should just pass, it should just work. And in my opinion, this is a really good way to test it because we're not really changing the exit response. We're only changing the backend data used for the process. So if I can confirm the output is still the same, regardless of service A or service Y is used, then that's a pretty good test and that we changed the back dependency, but we did not change what the user actually gets at the end of the experience. We made our process faster by switching to the other service, but we didn't change what the user gets. We just made our service more efficient. And that's exactly what we wanna test. The output is the same, but the dependency is different. So in theory, when we did the migration, we should have had some mapping that said all the fields in service A, and then there's all the fields in service B and their responses. This field maps to this one in the service Y response. This field maps to this other field. Let me show you. So imagine you have service A, you have service Y. These are the different fields they return in their JSON responses. And some of the mappings would be really easy. You had visitor ID, goes to visitor ID, parent, node, parent, maybe it's switched around a bit, it's parent, node. Um, but some of the things might not be as obvious, like the naming might be a little bit more different. 
and it's important to have this mapping so you know exactly what each thing should map to in this new service response with their new fields and how they format it. And like some of these, like last scene, maybe that's not in service Y. And so it doesn't exist. And so you want to confirm like, oh, we don't need that field. Totally fine. And like, say there's one in service A and it comes back with service Y. Like maybe we're using this in a unique way so that we don't have to call something else. But having this mapping, this should have probably been done when we initially did the migration. So we had a very clear idea of like what data we're using, what data are we not using, and how is it translated into the new response. It doesn't exist. Of course it doesn't exist, this mapping. There is some documentation surrounding uh, what fields we do use, but there isn't a verbose mapping of every field to whether we use it or every field to the translation in the new service. So I guess we'll create it. So now that we've created the mapping, we'll double check with the team to make sure that it's correct and it's kind of on, on the same like understanding that everyone else has. This happens a lot of time in software development where you have something that's kind of common knowledge or team knowledge and it's not written down, this being one of them. And this is a project I kind of worked on, but not too much. And so now that I'm working on the integration test for it, I need to know the mapping. And I could just like ask like for each individual field, like what does this go to? What does this go to? But to take a shot at the documentation and kind of give it all in one go and then you can get a ton of feedback at once, that's what I opted for because it's easier for me to just know what the mapping is and write it down. Now while we're waiting for the team to double check this mapping, we are going to make some lunch. Let's see what we have. This week we go back into the office and I'm anxious. I have very much enjoyed this work from home period. Um, I really like cooking during lunch and that's something I'm not going to be able to do when I go back in the office, but it will be exciting to see everyone again. Um, we are going back into the office, so Mondays we get work from home and then Tuesday through Thursday in the office and everyone goes in the office. It's not like pick your favorite three days to go into the office. Monday through Thursday, and then Friday, work from home. So we'll see how this in the office thing goes. But maybe I'll like the office again. Um, this does not look very appetizing, but it does smell good. A couple of you also uh, commented about my leaving tech video and the fact I haven't left tech. And I think wanting to leave tech is a part of being in tech. It's like they told you these lies of like, oh, you'll be able to create an app and it'll change the world and you'll be making things every three or six months that really impact real users, but that is not the case. And so maybe it's just that I had the wrong perspective on what software engineering was supposed to be and now I'm realizing what it actually is. Um, and maybe what it actually is is not that bad. It could also be, every, I think tech can be different at different companies, whether it's your speed of development or what your team prioritizes. It could be getting features out or the engineering work of how do you make something more efficient. But I think everyone that's in tech has wanted to leave tech at some point because the expectation is not the reality of what they, you know, what they tell you in the boot camp or in college is not what you actually do on the day to day job. I'm following this recipe. Um, I like these dinnerly kits, the no sponsor. Um, it's not a sponsor, but I like them. They send you the ingredients and then you cook them and it's very easy. I've been using it for like two years, a year and a half. Two years. Uh, highly, highly recommend. I'll probably, I'm sure there's some invite link I can put in the description. But one of you actually left a comment that was pretty interesting on my last video. So it says, what if I take your example and add a DB layer to it? So a database layer, if you have an application that has a database, if you mock the outgoing requests, should you mock the database as well? Uh, if not, then that, would that be a system test? Should you have a test DB for this purpose or a dev environment that's only meant to be for developers and builds and kind of your testing environments. 
great questions. And the answer is, is how, like your DB could also be a request out. So say your DB is on Amazon. You, in order to add something to your database, you're essentially doing an outgoing request to save it to your database. So in that case, yes, you could just mock the request and have a mock sample response from the database. Do you need to prove that it was actually inserted into the database? I think if it's a put command, you can assume that Amazon will work as expected and put the data in. You could mock like different, like what if the put fails and Amazon returns with a like 500 or something or 404 if like the table doesn't exist. I think you could add those tests and those mock responses, but testing whether it actually got put in. If the database returns a 200 with that API call to like put it into your cloud database, I think you're good. But let's say you were doing more than just like saving something once to a database. What if you were saving it to a database and then pulling it out again, modifying it, and then resaving it to the database? That's something that's a little more complex and that's where you would want to set up a running environment because typically a mocked response is only going, you mock it one time. You say this service is gonna return this thing for this type of input and that's done. You could technically do that for each time you write out to the database if you're writing out to the database multiple times in your application, but you could also stand up an internal database or a testing database environment. Both are options. It's just dependent, like likely the, the decision has already been made for you and that the team has already figured out which one they want to do and then you would just follow that pattern. I would say it's a better test if you do have that testing environment and it is actually writing out to that cloud database because it's more similar to like what you're doing in production versus like mocking everything and like hoping that is what Amazon or your cloud database returns, what Google returns. I would say though, like if you have all the time in the world and most of the times you don't, ideally your tests are prove out that what you're pushing to production works as expected. So the closer you can get to that, the better. But you also don't want like, because Amazon or Google Cloud is down, I can't run my tests. So it's like a, a balance of how much do you wanna rely on these services for your automated processes versus mocking them and hoping the mock is close enough or is what the actual service returns. So this is how you know a backend developer made this meal. There's the chicken in there and salad and then leftovers. But back to the other conversation. No matter what, you're gonna need to do something with your database. Any layer in your application where you're sending requests out, you're gonna need to mock it if it can't use the data that's already in the application to compute the process. All right, so the mapping is confirmed. Service A, we have service Y. We're migrating to service Y, and we've mapped each attribute to whatever its equivalent is in service Y. Now, we're really lucky because a lot of these are pretty much just renamed a little bit. Like, they're in the same level of the JSON, so instead of attribute A, it's like attribute underscore A. So what this means is we can do a lot of like control F and replace, and we can just replace given this sample response, do a replace and like just replace that text for this. Some of them have been completely, some of these attributes have been completely eliminated in service wise, so we can just do control F, replace, replace it with an empty line. There are some that are more complicated where say we have attribute C and attribute D and you use these two to figure out this new attribute Y. So that's something that's a little bit more manual. We could create a script in order to do this mapping. So given a response A, I can translate it into a response Y into this other form. And really we're doing this translation so that we can change the mock files that we have for service A into mock files for service Y. While we could create the scripts, the mock files, like they're like 200 lines long and there's a couple of them, but 99% of the work is just this find and replace, which we can do fairly easily and there's not that many attributes to do that find and replace for. It's like maybe 10 to 15. 
And then this mapping, it's only like one or two attributes where we really have to look at the JSON and be like, okay, I'm gonna put this here. And it's also a migration we're doing one time. So once I'm done migrating the files, we're done. So like I could create the script, but I'm just gonna do it manually because it's not that much thought. And first of all, to even find these old mock files, I had to go deep into git blame and figure out what PR they were deleted in because of course the old mock files for service A no longer in the code base. We deleted them already. Um, but we, I found them. I found the PR where they were deleted and I was able to match it up with each test and say, okay, this test pulls in this data. And so those are the files we'll need to translate and then rename and put in the code base. Like these mock files, you can do these control replace, you can do this quick mapping, but it's probably important for, uh, for us to understand like what these mock files actually mean. These mock files, they represent a series of connections. And so say you have this main entry point and like we have a JSON that represents something similar to this where it's like, okay, we've got one direct connection there. We have, you know, some indirect connections. We have some of those indirect connections have multiple outputs. Some of them are just like, you go to one, the next. And this is, if you have just a JSON file and you're able to put this in textual form, no matter what, it's gonna be hard to visualize because this is a, almost like a 2D type thing versus just a list of like one single item. So as part of this, I'm also creating some diagrams and some maps that basically say, okay, this mock file represents something like this. So that means if I wanna write a test for a node that's like indirectly connected, but then there are also nodes that are directly connected, it'll be easy for me to find um, a node that's like that. So I have my mapping, I have my diagram, I'm ready to code, I understand this is the mapping from service A to service Y. This diagram is what the mock file is supposed to represent. In that translation, if I do it correctly, all the verifications should pass and I don't have to change anything with it because we're changing a dependency rather than the output of what the code is, is outputting to the user. So I think we're ready to code. We're ready to write these integration tests. We're gonna take it one mock file at a time. I think there's like 12 we have to do, but um, we'll take it one at a time. And when I change a mock file, I'm also gonna change the test that that mock file was associated with it, or like what that new mock file is now replacing the service Y mock file over the service A mock file. Um, oh wait, look, it's 5 p.m. I guess that means we're done for today. So, all right, that's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time. Happy coding.